With eyes like blue ice and hair like black silk, Yvonne DiCarlo was frighteningly beautiful. So much so that she not only graced the screen as one of Hollywood's premier Technicolor darlings, she would also become known as one of television's most iconic vampire vixens when she became the matriarch of the Munster family as Lily Munster. However, more frightening than Yvonne's spooky TV family was her tumultuous childhood and career in Hollywood. From the time of Yvonne's birth in Vancouver, Canada in September of 1922, Yvonne's mother Marie already had her daughter's life mapped out. While on the delivery table, Marie could be heard by nurses yelling, I want a girl. It must be a girl. I want a dancer. Marie would get exactly that, but before that happened, the family would experience an immense heartbreak. At the age of three, Yvonne's father, William, would abandon their family after doing a series of shady business deals with the wrong people. Truly, it was like something out of the script of a crime noir thriller, but the dramatics didn't end there. Following William's disappearance, rumors spread claiming that he had actually perished at sea while trying to get away. Whatever the truth behind William's disappearance, which we'll talk about more later, this was the shaky foundation with which Yvonne's childhood would be built. Yvonne's mother never lost hope that her daughter would become a star, and she went to disturbing lengths to see that dream become a reality. After enrolling Yvonne in dance and singing classes, Marie would drive them back and forth to Los Angeles constantly so that Yvonne could participate in beauty contests and other such publicity stunts, all in the hopes that the teenager would attract attention. But as the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. For Yvonne, this went double. As it turned out, Marie was right about her daughter. She was destined to be a star, and in 1940, the very developed teen won second place at the Miss Venice Beauty Contest. Moreover, a talent scout who had been in the audience encouraged her to audition for a chorus line part at, at the Earl Carroll Theater. The theater was located on the famous Sunset Boulevard, and this was perfect. It was everything Yvonne had been training for, everything her mother had longed for. But when they got to the audition, they experienced their first taste of the shady side of show business. While at the audition, DiCarlo was faced with a harsh reality that would unfortunately haunt her for the remainder of her time in Hollywood. It turned out that Carol only wanted her there so that he could assess her assets, so to speak. This gross display of harassment understandably outraged Yvonne and her mother and they left immediately. Unfortunately, her next stop on the way to stardom would be just as exploitative in a different way. DiCarlo and her mother headed over to the rival nightclub Florentine Gardens looking to stick it to Carol, but it wouldn't be the victory they were quite hoping for. For this audition, DiCarlo would tap dance in front of a leering, raucous crowd, and then the club owner would leave her fate up to the audience, asking, well folks, is she in or out? After applause and wolf whistles, DiCarlo got the role, but her troubles were just beginning. Being a Canadian citizen without a green card, she was on borrowed time working in the U.S. Soon after a few months on stage, immigration caught up to her. They detained and deported her. But she would end up getting off easy. Her manager at Florentine Gardens, Niles Granlin, knew he had a star on his hands and he was desperate to keep DiCarlo in his pocket. He wrote to the Canadian government petitioning for her release, offering to sponsor and employ her steadily. The plea worked and DiCarlo was allowed to come back to Los Angeles. As her star kept rising, however, she would soon begin to accrue admirers and enemies. By the early 1940s, Yvonne had moved up the ranks and earned enough film roles plus a contract with Paramount Pictures. In 1942, she was cast as a handmaiden to the starlet Dorothy L'Amour in the Road to franchise, Road to Morocco. The success would prove to be a double-edged sword, as soon whispers began to circulate saying that DiCarlo was a threat to L'Amour, earning her her first major Hollywood rival and the glamorous movie star. Not only was DiCarlo's professional life heating up, her private life was as well. Just after she signed with Paramount, she met director Billy Wilder, who was about to make his masterpiece Double Indemnity a crime noir staple. The beautiful young starlet and the experienced homesman quickly fell into a dalliance, and DiCarlo would describe Wilder as the first love of her life. She would also describe him as the physical antithesis of my lifelong dream man, which is shady, but apparently it wasn't enough to keep her from falling into bed with him. Now, Wilder was actually a married man, although he and his wife had separated. Still, this wasn't the best foundation to build a relationship on, and it was made all the worse by the fact that the two were forced to keep their situationship, I guess? 
private in a small rented love shack where they would carry out their relationship in secret. To make matters worse, Yvonne was too young and naive to realize that she was just a rebound chick. And shortly after their passionate affair, Wilder would leave her for another up and coming actress by the name of Doris Dowling. Hurt and humiliated, the show had to go on and Yvonne would stumble upon one of the best roles of her life when the producers looking for an exotic actress for the part of Salome in their upcoming film, Salome Where She Danced, came not knocking on Yvonne's door. De Carlo ended up beating out 20,000 other women for this part. But there's a scandalous side to how she got this role in the first place. See, according to the lore, De Carlo nabbed the role of Salome because some young Royal Canadian Air Force pilots back home campaigned heavily for her, citing the starlet as one of their favorite pinup girls. The real story, however, was that De Carlo actually just had two pilot friends and urged them to get their buddies on board for a little PR stunt. Our girl was cunning and it paid off. Salome where she danced turned De Carlo into a glamour girl and bona fide pinup girl overnight. Although the film wasn't a critical success, audiences still turned out in droves to see this sexy screen siren slink and saunter across the stage. As one writer put it, she had all the looks one girl could ask for. More than that, Salome earned her a new contract with a new studio, Universal. Unfortunately, whenever DiCarlo's life was on an upswing, that meant that a downswing was just waiting around the corner, and it would come when she met the man that would eventually ruin her. At a release party for another film in her hometown of Vancouver, she ran into none other than notorious old Hollywood Lothario eccentric and billionaire Howard Hughes. Hughes was a long way from his stomping grounds in Los Angeles, and his reasons for being in Vancouver were sus to say the least. See, Hughes was infamous for dating beautiful starlets, and his seduction tactics could be a little unorthodox. With DiCarlo, this was no different. After announcing his intentions to woo Yvonne, Hughes admitted that he had seen Salome when she danced five times and had actually flown into Vancouver from Los Angeles just for the opportunity to holler at Yvonne. You would think that this would sketch Yvonne out, but no. Her response was just as weird. And just as with Billy Wilder, DiCarlo wasn't exactly in love with Hughes at first sight. In fact, she said that she just kind of felt sorry for Hughes, who looked lanky and underfed and remarkably sad. But maybe it was these men's lackluster looks that made DiCarlo think that they were going to worship the ground she walked on. Within a day of their meeting, DiCarlo and Hughes ignited a torrid romance, but while DiCarlo got over her pity for Hughes quickly and fell head over heels, her paramour did not feel the same way. Aloof and ungiving, Hughes would do things like take her up in one of his mini planes and teach her how to take off and land, but not actually fly. Which seems harmless, but this tendency of not giving DiCarlo what she actually asked for would become a cruel habit. The more Yvonne fell for Hughes, the more uncaring he seemed to become. He would ignore his girlfriend's attempts to get him to propose to her and refuse to reveal their relationship to the public. Soon after, the couple would break up, and that's when DiCarlo would go off the deep end. Billy Wilder and Howard Hughes had been DiCarlo's first forays into the frenzied love life of a famous movie star, and following her breakup with Hughes, she really let loose. She hooked up with stars like Robert Stack and Burt Lancaster, and dated so publicly that there were often three people in her love life at a time. Herself, her lover of the hour, and the press. So much so that the press began to give her the nickname Hollywood's number one bachelor girl. And as a woman living in the 1940s, that wasn't exactly the kind of moniker and reputation that you wanted to have. With a face like that though, could you really blame her? Besides, she did try to settle down. It's just that every time she tried to settle down, it went wrong. In 1947, Yvonne earned another respectably sized part in the film noir, Brute Force, starring none other than her ex-lover, Burt Lancaster. But this time, DiCarlo seemed to only have eyes for her fellow contract player, Howard Duff. Although DiCarlo was fresh off her wild streak, it didn't seem to matter to either of them and they quickly got engaged. This would end up being a bad idea. At first, everything looked like it was going well. Even the studio heads, who were notoriously picky about who their stars could and couldn't date, approved of this union. But there was one big problem. As DiCarlo admitted, the pair had almost nothing in common. In fact, Duff's biggest selling point was the fact that he wanted to marry her in the first place, something she'd never gotten from Hughes. After all that heartbreak, DiCarlo was willing to settle for a sure thing. Little did she know, her fiancé had a skeleton in his closet. 
By April of 1947, Duff and DiCarlo were as official as a Hollywood couple could get, having announced their engagement with Hollywood gossip papers awaiting their eventual nuptials. Until, that is, DiCarlo began noticing her husband's bad habit. He was a very heavy drinker, so much so that she made the decision to break off the engagement. Her next rebound, however, would be of epic proportions. When Prince Abdul Reza Pahlavi of Iran was visiting Hollywood, he met and became infatuated with Yvonne. Soon after, he was sweeping her off her feet, even taking her to his royal palace in Tehran. The royal fairy tale eventually petered out, but it did give DiCarlo a new sense of ambition in her career, and she got very big ideas. By this time, DiCarlo had been typecast in Hollywood as a costume drama and musical darling, which often used Technicolor to display the flashiness and grandeur of the sets. It was also seen as less serious than the typical black and white films. In fact, DiCarlo was so synonymous with the colorful style that for three years in a row, Hollywood cameramen voted her queen of Technicolor. The problem was she wasn't satisfied with these films. She wanted meteor roles, particularly in the film noirs that were very popular during the 40s. So when she got a juicy part in the noir crisscross opposite Burt Lancaster, she thought it was a dream come true. It would actually end up being a nightmare. Getting the role in Criss Cross had been a major triumph for her, but before DiCarlo even got to enjoy her accomplishment, she had her heart broken. Critics called her attempt at the femme fatale character uneven. Things would end up getting worse when her director on The Buccaneers Girl glibly noted that DiCarlo was not a first class star but came in on time. Yeah, in short he was calling her competent at best. Not talented, not good, just professional. That's great for a bank teller, but not what you want to hear as an artist. For all her efforts, DiCarlo never made it as one of the great femme fatale actresses of her time. Defeated, she returned to the films she no longer enjoyed, but that were her bread and butter, musicals, and technicolor spectacles. The late 1940s were a whirlwind for DiCarlo, and the next development didn't help matters. While filming the western The Gal Who Took the West, DiCarlo did as she usually did and fell in love with one of her crewmates. This time, it was a burly stuntman named Jock Mahoney. Once more hoping to settle down, DiCarlo accepted Mahoney's proposal, and once more it would end in heartbreak. During her engagement to Mahoney, DiCarlo found herself pregnant, and while her dream of finally being able to settle down and start a family seemed at the precipice, soon her joy would turn into a living nightmare. While going through her checkups, doctors found an ovarian cyst that they had to operate on and the surgery would mean that she would also lose the baby. After this tragedy, Yvonne would be faced with the heart-wrenching news that her husband was also having an affair with actress Margaret Field on the side. So, back at square one, the beginning of the 1950s would be a very dark period in Yvonne's life. Rather than rebounding by hopping from man to man, DiCarlo went the exact opposite and would cling to any proposal that any man would throw her way. By the 1950s, she had already been engaged twice more, once to English photographer Cornell Lucas and again to the actor Robert Urquhart, another one of her co-stars turned exes. In 1955, while filming Shotgun, DiCarlo happened to meet yet another stuntman named Bob Morgan. This time, however, something stopped their love affair in its tracks, another marriage. Morgan was married and had a daughter at home. DiCarlo claimed that despite their mutual attraction, she didn't want to break up the union. In a matter of months, extraordinary circumstances would bring the couple back together. Just after DiCarlo wrapped Shotgun, she got the offer of a decade. Renowned director Cecil B. DeMille offered her the role of Moses' wife, Sephora, in his epic film, The Ten Commandments, and DiCarlo accepted immediately. There, she ran into a very familiar face, Bob Morgan. During their reunion, DiCarlo learned that Morgan's wife had actually passed away, and now they were free to be together. The couple entered into an instant open affair and tied the knot on November 21st, 1955. Finally, DiCarlo had broken her streak of being a perpetual fiance. During her career, DiCarlo had picked up a reputation of being a steadfast actress, but not a stunning screen presence. Meanwhile, the Ten Commandments demanded a lot of its actors, and DiCarlo was terrified she wouldn't measure up. She began taking lessons in basket weaving and shepherding to make herself more authentic, and even started working with a drama coach to help her prepare for the role. But Cecil B. DeMille had something else in mind. See, DiCarlo had become the technicolor queen because of her beautiful blue eyes, but DeMille didn't feel that those eyes were fitting of a shepherd's wife. He said for authenticity that they should be brown. 
DiCarlo complained, but this was a DeMille film, so in went the contacts. However, the choice would end up paying off. Upon the release of the successful film, everyone was buzzing that DiCarlo would be getting a Best Supporting Actress nomination at the awards, and this praise went immediately to Yvonne's head. She began campaigning not for a Best Supporting Actress nomination, but for a Best Actress nomination, and her ego would get her right checked because DiCarlo ended up getting no nominations. <laughs> After that professional disappointment, a personal one would come soon after. DiCarlo's stuntman husband worked a dangerous job and in 1963, it finally caught up with him. While filming a train robbery scene for How the West Was Won, Bob Morgan was stunting as the marshal of the movie. In the scene, he had to hold on to a log between cars with one of the cars carrying a heavy load of timber. In mere seconds, this thrilling scene became horrifying. The chain holding the prop log snapped and several tons of timber fell onto DiCarlo's husband. When the dust cleared, DiCarlo was devastated. Although Morgan would survive the incident, he did not escape unscathed. In fact, it took him five full years to finally be able to walk properly again without the aid of others. Outraged and faced with enormous medical bills, not to mention two children to take care of, DiCarlo and her husband would sue the studio for unsafe working conditions. MGM claimed no responsibility for the accident and by the mid-1960s, the couples were low on funds and constantly fighting. DiCarlo thought of one place that she could turn. John Wayne was a friend of hers and offered her a role in his western comedy McClintock. It was a small role, but it did help pay the bills. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough and DiCarlo was still hard up for cash. Her desperate measures led her to a performance that would redefine her career for better or for worse. In just a handful of years, DiCarlo went from turning her nose up at a supporting actress nod to begging for any role she could take. Still, when the role of Lily Munster in the TV sitcom The Munsters came to her, she was extremely hesitant. Even so, she didn't have much of a choice. She needed the money and an American TV show would be a big steady paycheck. So she said yes dreading what her more workaday co-stars would think of her. But everything that should have gone wrong with the Munsters didn't. The cast actually found that they loved Carlo. She had great comedic timing and she had no trace of the Hollywood glamour girl attitude they thought she would. DiCarlo found that she loved the cast, the writing, and the fun. Plus, she drew inspiration from her character from a surprising place. When people wondered how the former glamour queen nailed the camp role of Lily Munster on each episode, DiCarlo's response was that the creators advised her on the first day of shooting to play it like Donna Reed, an American sweetheart type who starred in her own whole some family sitcom. While filming the Munsters, DiCarlo drove a Jaguar sedan. Getting into the spirit of things, she customized her car with spooky ornaments as a tribute to the work she was doing on the hit show. Only problem was, fans kept stealing the ornaments as souvenirs from the actress. Yet, there was more in store for DiCarlo. Her role on the Munsters opened even more doors for her, and when Stephen Sondheim was working on his musical called Follies about washed up stars facing old age, he immediately thought of DiCarlo. Okay, that's not the most flattering, <laughs> that's not the most flattering reason to be thought of, but this was actually better than it sounded. DiCarlo ended up becoming a muse for one of Sondheim's hit songs. DiCarlo would happily take the role on Broadway and belt out the tune, I'm Still Here. Thankfully, the show was a huge success. Unfortunately, however, DiCarlo's private life was falling apart. After years of bickering about money and finding they could no longer push past the trauma of the MGM accident, DiCarlo and her husband Bob Morgan filed for divorce in 1973, with DiCarlo citing irreconcilable differences after returning home from a tour of New Zealand one year. With her only marriage over and done with, DiCarlo decided to start spilling all about her scandalous and numerous affairs. And I mean everything. In 1987, DiCarlo would pen an autobiography where she let it all hang loose. She mentioned that she had 22 lovers, many of them handsome A-list movie stars that had no brains. She came to realize in her time dating around that she preferred character over looks and would much rather date a scientist like Albert Einstein than some hot dumb guy. Not too long before that, she would let out another scandalous secret when in a 1975 interview, she would reveal that her father, whom she always named as William Middleton, a small time crook who was from New Zealand, was actually a Polynesian man. The end of Yvonne's tumultuous life was not a happy one. In 1997, her son died suddenly, leaving her absolutely devastated. 
Soon after, she had a minor stroke that led to her checking into the hospital. It was here that DeCarlo would spend the last nine years of her life in this institution until heart failure took her life in 2007 at the age of 84, thus ending the tumultuous life of one of television's most beloved TV moms.